Welcome, Chancellor Vance. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I'm going to turn on my timer, which has the salutary effect on the rate of speaking. Uh, and I want to welcome everyone here this afternoon for amazing as it is for me the 11th of these opportunities that I've had uh, to talk about the state of the campus. Uh, I want to single out and thank uh, perfectly standing, handing out uh, Sylvia Payne here. Uh, Sylvia is the secret behind uh, presentations in our office for over 20 years. Uh, having served uh, Jerry Bepko before uh, me, and uh, Sylvia makes magic happen, but often you hear me say there's this quotation or this idea that's in a speech. This is where they come from, and I want to ask everybody to give her a round of applause. I don't often successfully get her out of the office to come to uh, one of these, so I'm pleased to have her here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all of you who've been involved in the process of the strategic plan. Uh, and I'm going to say some more about that, but because this is going to be a different uh, state of the campus, more focused on future, uh, less focused on a summary of what's happened. Uh, but as I go through, I'm going to talk about what's been accomplished, and I always want to make sure that people recognize what has been done, and I'm going to continue that theme because this is truly a place that is different fundamentally than it was 40 years ago and 30 years ago and 20 years ago and 10 years ago. And in spite of the Hoosier modesty thing, I, which I try and set aside on this day of all days, uh, it is something for us to celebrate because it is a different campus. It is a different university education and research performance than we had before. So I want to thank you all for that. Uh, this chart is one of uh, Nasser's creations. Uh, I love engineers for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but one of the things Executive Vice Chancellor and uh, Chief Academic Officer Nasser Paydar brings is a planning approach. And so when he was hired, one of the assignments he had first and foremost was to lead the strategic planning process, the first campus-wide effort, the first that was literally covering everything in a decade. And so it began in July of 12, and if you can't read it, the basic concept is gather information, bring people together, talk about ideas, generate documents, share those documents, get feedback, take it back, and continue that process all the way through the S-curve. Uh, it was, I think, probably a fairly exciting drive in the uh, uh, Paydar Mobile uh, as it moved uh, on those curves. But it was a drive that many of you took with Nasser and the whole team. And the only way that we've generated, I think, the kind of understanding about this plan has been so many people took the time to become involved and make this happen. And so I want to thank all of you who've been involved, and it is in the hundreds of you who've been involved. And several of you have done a huge amount of lifting, uh, and I want to thank especially those of you uh, who chaired committees and have made much of it, Steve, happen behind uh, the scenes. So thank you very much for that. One of the metaphors that uh, has come up is that the cream, the best of ideas, have risen to the top. Uh, that's a metaphor that doesn't work with people who are young because they don't know what cream rising to a top is. Uh, but it is one that uh, those of us who grew up with an aunt and an uncle who ran a dairy farm uh, do have a visual memory of. Uh, and I also have the memory of I don't want that lifestyle that you've got to milk cows two or three times every day, every single day, every single day, your whole life. That strikes me as a commitment to a way of life. It sounds a little bit like being an academic that we're committed to every day in every way. Uh, but our plan, I think, has produced a lot of ideas. I always want to start planning out with this mission statement. And you should know I use this slide in more places than a slide with this many lines deserves. 
because it's got too many lines on it. But I do that because I have to tell you, this group, the faculty council at IUPUI, got this right. This is amazingly resilient. It's eight years old. It is a description of this place and its aspirations. On Friday, I spoke to the uh, Indiana University Foundation Board, and I remind them, you cannot remove IUPUI and plug in any other campus in this state. And it's not just because it says a partnership of Indiana and Purdue. You can take that clause out. You cannot plug in any other campus name. In fact, I don't believe you could plug in the name of any other institution I've worked at, in spite of them being excellent institutions, and have that fit. This is a mission that reflects who we are and what we wanted to become, and I would argue have made progress in becoming, but we're not done. And the key distinction, I believe, in this is we recognize the incredible strength we had being in urban research setting and being the Academic Health Science Center for the state of Indiana. That combination of recognition of reality, I think, drove us to become much stronger in the last decade. The other piece, which is distinctive, is we actually own a responsibility for the state of Indiana and beyond. We actually say it's our job to help the economic, cultural, and educational development of the state. There are educational institutions, higher education, who will never claim that. And you can look at their mission statements and look for it and not find it here. This is something we've claimed, and I believe it's one of the key strengths, as you will see as I review this and look forward in the plan. Part of that strategy has been to in a degree I had not experienced elsewhere that we were willing to own that we had a contribution to make to certain economic clusters in this state. It is not the only contribution we make to the state. I happen to believe that the liberal arts and sciences are essential contributions to every undergraduate's education. And I think if we don't do that well, frankly, we fail them. But I also believe we have an opportunity because we have strength in each of these areas to contribute to the state. The first three areas are the state economic clusters and the bottom two are the city of Indianapolis's in central Indiana clusters. And we actually have strength in these areas. So for example, Battelle did a study last year which established that Indiana, as a state, ranks in the top five in the United States for life science. We're in the group with New Jersey, pharmaceutical capital of America, with California, with Massachusetts, Indiana is on that list for life sciences. We're not the only campus that contributes to that, but we are the largest contributor to that. And that is a key role we play. Similarly, if you look at advanced manufacturing, this is the one that always catches people off guard. Indiana ranks always in the top five and usually in the top three and often number one in the percentage of our economy driven by manufacturing. And that has been true in spite of the complete restructuring of the American auto industry. Now it hasn't hurt that we built a Honda plant, or more accurately, Honda built a Honda plant, and it hasn't hurt that pharmaceuticals are manufactured in this state, and that Roche Diagnostics is one of our largest employers in the life science area because they manufacture instruments. So there's an overlap between these two, but that's a key part. And we play a role on this campus because we have one of the largest technology programs in the United States. And one I'm proud to say that shows up regularly is producing the most women in technology in this country from a program. And we have engineering and we have other areas that contribute. Information technology is another example. 
People often used to say, well, are we really Silicon Valley? And the answer is no. Have you ever looked at the numbers in Silicon Valley? I mean, it's staggering. But we've always been a little engine that could in this. And so, for example, Ali Jafari and David Mills start a company, Angel Learning, which sells for $100 million. Others here started at Exact Target, and oops, that's in the billion dollars that it was sold for in the last year. So we're going to see others of these startups that produce that, and our faculty and students play a role in that. Not defining, in most cases, except Ollie's work, but important. Similarly, arts, culture, and tourism, we of course have Heron on this campus that plays a role in that, but there are other aspects of arts and culture that are important in this city, and tourism, tourism, tourism is critical to all of us. All those hotels are not there to serve this campus, all right? It's the tourist, and we all know it's easy for us to recruit people who have visited here as a tourist. I always joke, I had slept in Indianapolis one night when I accepted this, this job, and it, and it was literally in a conference in my discipline in 1995, and I figured out it was at the Hyatt, all right? That's the only memory I had of the place. We, many of us had that experience. And then nonprofit management and philanthropy, of course. And we have focused and built to these strengths, and we've reinforced that. Again, it's not all we do, but that's critical to what we do. I'm going to run through these, what we've done in the past, and I'm going to use the doubling slides. And if you're new to this, you need to know I've been showing these slides since 2003, and damn, they look better today. <laughs> All right? We graduated in 2002 just over 2,200 students with baccalaureate degrees. 1,600 more students graduated last year. 1,600, now it isn't doubled, but it is 1,600 lives that are different than they were, and we collectively made that happen. This is one of the achievements of this campus, and we ain't done. Thank you. That's for yourselves, you all do it. So we've increased our Six-year graduation rate, and this is news, folks, because it startled me on Friday when I pulled up this slide and went 42% graduation rate in six years. We were in the 20s in the last century. This is astounding. We're not done, but what a progress that we've made. External funding, well, nobody likes the turn down from the 400 million when we were 98% above where we started. We almost doubled. We came within a couple million dollars of doubling in that year. The stimulus money, remember, helped. But we're still up 50%. This is good, but we know this is one of the challenges going forward. And this is a key part of strategic planning, is how we're going to keep moving this up across the campus in a variety of ways. But we do need to celebrate. The only reason we're up like this is the incredible commitment of researchers who've written proposals. Those of you who have been up at 3 o'clock in the morning getting that stuff finalized in order to submit it in that system, we owe you because you've done that. And that's a key part. But it's not obviously the only part of research that we can talk about. Civic engagement, we chose to measure by service learning. It's not the only measure. Uh, it is an astounding story. Not only did we double, we managed to quadruple, and then we nearly quintupled, and now we're back to only quadrupling, okay? We've got over 40% of our undergraduates in one year take service learning course for credit. I couldn't have made this up. I never in my wildest dreams believed we'd get this high. And faculty have figured out how to scale service learning for this number of students. It's incredible, and it's a key defining characteristic of this campus. Now, one of the other great parts of the last year has been 
we held a celebration at the end of September of the impact campaign. And that number is a real number. That is how much money we raised in six years and nine months in the last campaign. And why that's so closely set next to service learning and to some other things I'm going to talk about is because it would not have happened without a connection to this community. This money was not all raised from our graduates, although I hope in the next campaign that'll grow. It was even raised, you'll love this part, more dollars came from Bloomington graduates to our campaign than from our own. Now, before you laugh too hard, Steve, Mel Simon is a graduate of the Bloomington campus, Simon Cancer Center. Eugene Glick was a graduate of the Bloomington campus. And Jesse Cox was a graduate of the Bloomington campus. That's over $100 million from three people who were graduates. Now, bless their hearts. But what it also shows is that people give to their community. Jesse never went here. He loved the experience he had in Bloomington. The man was never seen without an IU red hat on. And he gave a third of that gift, $30 million, to us because he made his life here. And he wanted to help students who needed to work. So as we think about a campaign, we think about this, you, faculty, staff, and retirees made a big contribution. And our community made the bigger contribution. It's astounding what we received from our community, including the philanthropies in the community, like the endowment, or the foundation with the Lilly Company, or the Lumina Foundation, and we can go through all of those. So we've had an astonishing line in the last 10 years. They're mostly going exactly where we want. So what the question I want to ask is, what's next? And I love this slide, because I love the metaphor of this campus being a campus that was a plane that was flying with propellers and switched to jet engines back over the last 20 years. And now, frankly, we need a spaceship because that's who we are, that that's the level we need to be at. So we're going to change engines again while we're flying. We don't get to stop in a university and say, hold it, we're going to take a year off, we're going to figure out what we're going to do. Oh, all those students in medical school, wait, just hold it. You, don't, you can wait. It doesn't work that way, especially at this campus. I mean, after all, this is the campus that taught tens of thousands of students without a campus center, all right? And in 10 years, somebody's gonna say, we taught tens of thousands of students without a, fill in the blank, I'm gonna let you fill it in because that's part of planning. Because we're gonna have added things that are seen as essential. So what the planning process has done is set priorities, student success being number one, Advancing in health and life science, number two, and then co contributing to the well-being of the region, the state, and the nation, and the world, I would say. What I love about the language of this draft is that it makes clear we're going to build on strength, we're going to respect what we've done, and we're going to drive this spaceship forward at a faster pace. So what I'm going to ask you in the time as I go through the initiatives, the 10 initiatives, is I'm going to constantly be saying, I want you to think about what can draw us in to the next decade or the next decades to make the contribution to the future that our predecessors have given us. And I'll give you in a concrete example. I believe we owe big time Jerry Bepko and Bill Plater and Gene Temple for cooking up the Center on Philanthropy. 
This is literally one of the world's greatest assets about philanthropic study. And they had the risk-taking craziness to say, we're going to create an academic discipline and do research on it. And it wasn't like they looked around and said, well, Harvard's doing it. We should, you know, we can learn from them. They stepped off the cliff. And today we have the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy with a going towards a $100 million endowment and is doing the best research in the world. They did this over and over again, and some of you know people, and some of them are your colleagues who did it in their research. Larry Einhorn talks about how his first patient, John Cleland, stepped off with him into the abyss. John, Larry said, had no way to know what it was going to mean to take those cocktails to fight testicular cancer. And it was awful. And he kept doing it. And as a result, he's taught biology in Zionsville for almost 30 years because Larry saved his life when he had a 5% chance to live. That's the kind of thinking I want you to take. How can we step ahead to the future? So the first of these is, of course, strategic initiative. One is to promote undergraduate learning and success. We got to do that. It is one of the areas we can improve in. We've made that great progress. And remember, we're still at 42% six-year graduation, not 70% like one of our other campuses in the state, or 68 like another campus in the state, or 95 like Notre Dame. You know, anytime I'm feeling smug about how we're doing, I just think of Father Jenkins and 95% graduation. I think they're at 90% four year, by the way. Okay. And I can tell myself why they do better. And we can learn from that. We can learn as we always have by what the data say about what works. So the high impact practices for some of you is like a mantra for some of you, like what is this jargon? This is the data that shows what activities, strategies truly do move the bar, move the success of our students. Unless you think that we don't take that seriously, this is Gary Pike's latest study with his colleagues that's going to be published. And I'm not going to ask you to read it, but I'm going to say, tell you that the third red line from the bottom says, if you're enrolled full time in your first semester, it predicts graduating in four years, five years, and six years at a significant level. So Nasser and his colleagues took a look at this and said, how many of our students are registering for 15 plus credit hours? And the answer was 28, 29, 27, used to be 21 percent of all first time, full time students were full time, but only 21 percent were taking enough credits to graduate in four years. You got to take at least 15 credits. You can't graduate even at 120 hours, much less more. And so being the clever engineer, Nasser and his colleagues said, OK, why aren't they higher? And they approached the advisors and told the advisors to tell people to take more hours. And this fall, 51% of our first time full time class, which, by the way, is over 400 students larger than last year, are taking 15 or more hours. And these data would say they're going to persist. They're going to graduate. And we'll take a look at that. We'll look at the data and see, is that what's being successful high impact practices? So we drive at this, and this, I believe, is the one thing we have to constantly focus on. It doesn't say every student should graduate who comes here. Some students come to the wrong place. But we are in a position now of selecting students like we weren't in the last century. Some of you weren't here. You don't know that one of the secrets was we didn't select students in the 20th century at IUPUI. We accepted students, basically. And as a result, we had a high fail rate. We've reduced that. We've predicted success. 
out of these kind of data and we're doing a better job, but we have to keep pushing this. Other areas that we see are optimizing enrollment management. We've been working on shaping our enrollment since we eliminated open admission, figuring out who should go to Ivy Tech as Ivy Tech grew. We've been working on this in terms of trying to get more non-resident students. We've changed the mix of our graduate students and undergraduate. This chart, which you're looking at squinting, about the only thing you can see dramatically different is the blue bar above Kelly that suddenly drops down to the next color, and there's an easy explanation. I love data like this, it's so clear. We move the Kelly Direct Online MBA cohort to the Bloomington campus. And of course, that dramatically fell off, and you'll see that they're basically level, but you'll see science and engineering and technology is on a slight upward curve. Social work's on an upward, but less so curve. A couple of them, like SLIS, was on a down curve. Uh, but we're pleased to hear they've leveled as they're part of informatics this year. But we've seen some of these, and this is just trying to suggest. I'm not trying to show you the data. We need to continue to look at enrollment management and ask ourselves, what's the right mix? Who do, can add to the quality of the experience for our students? So I'll preview one issue. I think we mean, need more non-residents. I thought that when we started enrollment shaping, I think it's more now, even though we're at 9%. And about half of those are international students, by the way. So I think we need those students to get a better mix of the educational experience. And the dean from Heron may appreciate knowing that your accreditors today agree with this idea. In fact, they raised and said, why are there so few non-residents in Heron? It's nationally known. Why is that the case? And I would point, I said, well, I thought it'd make a better art school if you had a mix of people from all over. And they thought that was a good idea, which it's good to know that Chancellor wasn't just making it up in this case. So trying to improve our enrollment management, trying to be more successful, I think is a key part of the next decade's work. And by the way, transfer students are gonna become increasingly important from Ivy Tech. Because one of the charts I don't have here that shows that Ivy Tech students are taking more credit hours and coming in larger numbers dramatically to our campus. And so you're gonna see them coming with 60 hours instead of 16 hours over the next decade. And that's good because the data show they'll be more successful as well. Graduate education has been a long, long mission on this campus. Some of you in this room remember when we had almost no graduate education that wasn't in the professional schools. Uh, and we have built systematically over the decades, but we still have work to do in a couple areas. One is we need to look at the creativity of Kelly and the kind of partnership degrees. This is, I think, a great way to serve our community and to serve the nation in that. And if you haven't heard about the MD, the MBA for practicing MDs, you don't listen to public radio. Uh, they, they advertised every single morning, I swear to God, for three months straight on the, my drive time. Uh, but this is an example, but the other one that's not in this slide is PhD programs. This, if you looked at this campus 10 years ago, there were two things that stood out as this campus being totally different from our peer urban universities. One was residence halls. When I asked Vic Borden what was the biggest single difference in the success of our undergraduates, he literally, without taking a breath, said residence halls. We had about 300 beds on campus when I arrived. We have 1,700 this fall. We have 200 more across the river in Park Place. We're making that progress. Dr. Davenport with it at this moment, he is thinking and we need 500 more immediately because we actually have data to show that. So we need to grow that. The other one may surprise some of you. This is a campus that has thousands of doctoral professional students, dentistry, medicine, law. We have, in a year, routinely, between 25 and 50 PhDs we grant in total. 
that's only 150 to 200 less than most of our peers. It is the single biggest thing that stands out. So we've been working on developing. Mike Patchner had a PhD when I arrived and has invested in trying to get more students in and through that program. Nursing has increased programs as well as separating out the doctor of nursing practice. We added in philanthropy, we've added in health communication, we've added in economics, but focused on health and philanthropy. We've very carefully strategized of how to move this number, and we're gonna have to keep doing that. That is a challenge, and it's one that I know Nasser Pedar is very interested in working on, and we're gonna work on some other issues as I look at some people from Purdue schools uh, as well. Online education, this is not news anymore. What's news is, are we going to move in certain markets in certain ways? We've, we were the place that invented Kelly Direct online. And it is the most successful, I think it's fair to say, online MBA program from a quality place. How's that? Uh, to describe it. So we, we've got that experience. We have the experience in a variety of technology ways. Ali Jafari uh, did the technology for Kelly Direct with Angel. Uh, and you see uh, Daryl Bailey here, uh, the current Ali Jafari technology is called Course Networking. It allows you to have large open courses or large numbers of uh, people in courses. And Daryl did a, a uh, course that was targeted at uh, listening, uh, what they used to call a music appreciation. But this is music listening for the listener course uh, that was successful last year. And it was a great example of new technology, faculty who have great experience. Our program isn't called Music and Arts Technology by accident. They've been teaching online as long as I've been here uh, in that kind of work. But we also need to say what other opportunities. Philanthropy is thinking about in the masters online. We've got the Department of Communication Studies and Liberal Arts that's looking at public speaking online, all right, and trying to scale that. We've got people in other disciplines developing courses uh, to look, and we're even working on the idea of how to assess prior learning through technology. This is a great opportunity for us, the Master of Social Work uh, trying to serve, and it's an area that uh, Dr. Paydar demonstrated at IU East. There are lots of opportunities for degree completion that we need to have done. L health and life science is central to our strategy. We have to continue to leverage this, the assets we have. Uh, you need to know that we now have the largest undergraduate medical class, that's the MD class, in America for two years in a row. We're now at 344. To put this in context, the Mayo Medical School in Rochester, Minnesota, very well-known uh, institution, we're seven times bigger than their class, all right? This is a huge medical school. That's one, obviously, key part of it. Nursing is very large. We have a very significant dental school on the campus. We have health and rehabilitation science, social works involved in this. We have all of those assets that you see listed in, and now, of course, the Fairbanks School of Public Health. Two areas that this becomes really key in. One is interprofessional education in teaching and learning. And that is, for those of you who don't know the inside baseball jargon, this involves actually considering teaching together dentists and physicians, actually sharing classes, actually working together to have the experience of working on teams before you actually have to do it in a hospital or in a clinic. This is a challenge for all sorts of reasons that anyone who studies human behavior can explain. All right, this is a real challenge. Uh, and it is one that our colleagues have decided they're gonna take on. And I think it's one that some other people on the campus who have expertise in groups, expertise in teams, expertise in diversity, expertise in customer service, all could help this program be successful. It's not the first try in American healthcare to do this, and I want us to be the one who succeeds at it. And why I think it's so important is if you're gonna be reimbursed for success, 
You cannot have the team in the way the team has to make that work effectively. And that's the direction American healthcare is going. We also have a lot of opportunities on the research side, and I wanted to show the Clinical Translational Institute for two reasons. One is it is our probably second largest grant in the entire university in its history. Uh, they, they have been just renewed for five years at $30 million, and Anantha Shekhar and his team have done a terrific job. This partners from Notre Dame to Bloomington and almost everybody in between. Uh, it truly does bring together people. It supports research, and so for example, if anything you do on, appears on that left side, that's a grant program that CTSI could fund your work, and there's some possibilities there. They're trying to support research. The other reason I want to emphasize it is because this is a great example of where I think we've got to be looking into the future in research and health and life science. Complicated organizational collaborations that are pushing to translate into practice. I think if we do that, we then have the opportunity to fundamentally improve the quality of human life. And so for example, everyone knows Obesity is a huge problem, and diabetes is a huge problem that goes with that. We have people on this campus who are doing leading work on that. How do we get them connected to all the other people who are doing that work and see if we can collectively move the entire city and the state on that? There are going to be opportunities, I think, to do that because this community is going to launch I believe in a very short time, an effort about diabetes, and we're gonna to need to support that in a variety of ways. There are numerous examples of the kind of research in this area. This is just one, but I'm asking those of you who do work in this area to think about who can you work with, partner with, in order to move this ball over the next decade. Similarly, we want across all research, inclusive of health and life science, but across the entire campus to accelerate innovation and discovery. Uh, this example I love because while it says it's about urban health, it comes out of studying dirt and lead. Gabe Filippelli has been doing this kind of work on lead and lead poisoning and how it shows up in children from their exposure by literally playing outside for a long time and has built this now into a multidisciplinary project with support from NSF. And it shows, I think, an example of that kind of partnership. This has a dramatic impact, potentially, on our community. This is about children's health. And lead poisoning is bad. It has long-term effects. And so here we've got somebody on our campus who's in what used to be known as geology, earth sciences, who's doing this work. And this is a good example, I think, of how IUPUI has managed to bring together people from a variety of disciplines and make those kinds of uh, research projects happen. I do think that we need, collectively, to see how we can stimulate our colleagues and support our colleagues in other kinds of research like this. It doesn't have to be this. Someone in this room is working on or working with someone who's got one of those ideas about what's the issue, what's the problem for the next generation of research. We've got to capture that and support it. And so that's one of the things I'd ask you to do as you think about implementing this strategic plan is where are people that you've run across who need that kind of support in order to be successful. And I do think we have such experience in certain areas of this, we can be more successful than other campuses. So for example, as many of you have heard me say, this is the most translational campus I've ever been on in my whole life. And that's why Sandra saw the notion of translating research into practice. That's Sandra Petronio back there who translating research into practice and celebrating the incredible variety of people who do that on this campus. We've got people who invent 
instruments, all right? You don't invent instruments that can be used in surgery just to admire them. You want to put it into practice, and you test it out. We've got people who have done this in an astonishing variety of disciplines, and I do think that's one of our assets because not only are we doing that, our community supports us to do it. One of the reasons we have raised in this century $2.4 billion is because our community believes we want to help that community get stronger. Now, the good news is they're right. We have wanted to help them get stronger. And we've done this in such a variety of ways that we have to, excuse me, we have to continue to work at it. Read the screen. The range of these partnerships is amazing. IPS, we've got students working with them. The right side corner is the East Side Legacy Project. Our colleagues uh, from Physical Education and Tourism and Management are out there working with people in that exercise facility. On the lower side, our medical students started a clinic on the east side, didn't bother to tell the lawyers, which made the lawyers a little anxious. Uh, but <laughs> we've got that worked out. Uh, mostly, and uh, we have faculty out there with the students, and we've got dentistry involved, we've got physical therapy involved, we've got social work doing all the intakes on that. We've got Butler's pharmacy students there, we've got U Indy's physical therapist there, and oh, by the way, the governor gave them the governor's award for community service just last month. They deserve it. And to make it even better, our trustees, student trustee, Janice Farlow, an MD, PhD student, she was the medical uh, leader in the last year out there. So there she is with a one and a half year old on Saturday out there working in the clinic, not with her child in hand, that wouldn't be a good idea. But that kind of commitment of our students and of our faculty and staff, and the lower right hand corner for those of you who don't recognize the sculpture over at the avenues, was a Basile Center for Art and Public Life Commission uh, that Buckingham Properties did and did a competition and one of Valerie's students won that competition and that sculpture is there. So we do this in so many ways. I just wanted to emphasize the student side of it here. Our faculty in so many ways are involved in this. And I believe here's our challenge. If you want to feel stress, be the leader. All right? We are the national leader in this. We are. There are very few things that we can say we are preeminent in. We are in engagement. We won the President's Award. That would be the President of the United States Award the first year it was offered. We have been a finalist. We have been on a roll with distinction and on the honor roll ever since, every year with different proposals. We win virtually every award, and we deserve it. So my challenge for this next decade is, what is the next level? That's a really hard one. But boy, isn't it nice to be in the position to say, we can define the future again in an area we're really great at. And I think that's what Number seven is really about. Number eight is internationalization, and I love this because it stitches together so many things we've talked about. Because we do community service in Kenya, in, in China, and in Honduras. We don't let national borders get in the way of our community service and in community engagement. But we also recognize it's fundamental to education and to research and I do believe that we've made progress, but this is one of our challenges. We need more resources to support students to do this. We just do. And so I think in the next campaign, this has to be a focus, and I think we need people to be really creative about how to get students to have this experience. I also believe we need to support faculty doing this. 
I am one of the faculty who never had traveled abroad except to Canada to go fishing with my father until I was a faculty member. And it changed my life. I literally had a different career because of those experiences. Published different things, worked on different projects, can actually distinguish parts of the, you know, Israel and other countries that I read about because I had that opportunity. We need to make sure that's available and, Lee, we need to think about how to do this for staff. Last year we had a Sun Yat Sen fellow who was a staff member in the president's office. And I want you to know, he tells me they send three people around the world every year from their campus for basically a semester. And Lee, you'll be proud that I was embarrassed that I had never thought of that. This is something we need to think about. How can we help our staff understand the work that we're all doing together if we do not provide them the opportunity to go to Guangzhou? And if you've never been to China, Going to Guangzhou is a great introduction because if you go away for a week, you come back, there's another building. I mean, and that's only a slight exaggeration. So trying to think about how to do this for our students and make those opportunities, I think is fundamental to us as we go forward in this plan. IUPUI, I'm pleased to say in the accreditation visit, we got a criticism about diversity. And it was, you've done quite well, and you can do better. That was why I felt so good about this report. That was the criticism. But they were right, and in fact, they understated it. We have done very well in some areas. We have grown our undergraduate student body diversity. It roughly approximates the SAT test takers in central Indiana. All right, so that's a, we've made progress. We have increased African American graduation rates, but they're still too low, but they've dramatically increased. If you look at the senior administration of this campus, it doesn't look like me, and I'm proud of that. But if you look at the deans, you all look like me, mostly. We haven't been as successful there. And there are other areas we know we need to be more successful. Latinos is a good example. So I'm pleased Karen Dace, some of you heard speak to the faculty council earlier, is here with us, an experienced leader in diversity from two other institutions uh, much like us. And Karen has the opportunity to help shape us in a plan and move us forward. But we do need to work in this because we will not be successful at the level we've got to be if we're not diverse in all dimensions. And I want you to know in preparing for this, I, had, I, I reflected on one thing that I would have overlooked and I want us to celebrate it. Our students, with the help of Student Affairs and the Diversity Office, have since five years ago established a Cesar Chavez dinner that now fills this room and fills a hotel room a couple times. We've had to go off campus. And the Harvey Milk Dinner by the GLBTQ students didn't totally fill the full room, but pretty close in its third year. We, of course, have a MLK dinner that goes back to 1969, appropriately enough, from the very first year of this campus. So we've had our students take that kind of strength and celebration. And our Asian Pacific Island uh, group has had an event as well. So we have managed to add those things we need to keep moving those forward. The 10th initiative is in many ways a core initiative. And we didn't talk about this, I think, enough in previous times, that we need to support and develop our faculty and staff. We've done a lot of things. So the Centers for Teaching and Learning, Service and Learning, and Research and Learning, outcome for students, but are clearly development for faculty and staff. And it has made a huge difference, it appears to me, in the success of our faculty as teachers. Because it's very clear that those of you who are deans and chairs 
encourage faculty to get that kind of support from CTL. And we see that the Office of Women has been successful, I think, in creating some programs and awareness and support, including in partnership with the Vice Chancellor for Research of a program on mentorship for assistant professors to go to promotion, to associate and associate to go to full. And I think that's a key part of what we do. But I think most of us might not have thought about the Don Rhodes starting the service with distinction was a key development opportunity for our faculty and staff. Of course it improves the quality of service on the campus and that's really nice for all of us, and especially of course our students, but for all of us. But it also gives the staff and faculty the opportunity to improve their skill sets, to think about things in their own lives that, and work life they hadn't thought about. So I think we need to continue to say how can we advance and support our faculty and staff. And I do think the idea, the international experience idea, frankly, I think is a terrific one. And we ought to find, figure out how we can fund something like that and do something. I think we ought to work systematically and I'm gonna ask that our colleagues make this a key part of what they do. And at our uh, table in the Vice Chancellors, we talk about how we're strategizing to do this. Some of you do a lot of this already in your units and we can learn from you. Some of you happen to be academic specialists in this and we can utilize your strength. And so we can work in this area as well. The next steps in this plan, I think are gonna be about communicating and implementing and integrating because the president of the university announced in his address that we're going to collate these plans from the campuses into a university plan. They're not gonna be as, as uh, um, uh, John Applegate continually says, not the Russian dolls, they're not all gonna look alike. Uh, they're gonna actually collate them together and they will reflect the differences of the campuses. Uh, but we're gonna do that within the context of the principles of excellence, which are exceedingly well fitted to this planning uh, because of the emphasis obviously on educating students, on the quality of our faculty, the excellence of our research. This fits perfectly with it. But we will need you to keep pushing the ideas. And if you take away anything, I want you to take away that what it is on us for the next five years, say, is for us to keep saying, where do we need to push to leave our successors positioned like our predecessors did? That's why this campus has succeeded. People never were self-satisfied. That's the disease, I believe, that kills higher education. Oh, we're just fine. It doesn't work that way. You wouldn't tolerate it in your own research. The idea that somebody could come in and say, excuse me, I figured out materials in 1850. You know, you'd laugh them out. And God forbid we'd want the health care of 1850. All right, that was before the Civil War, which was considered to be the time that moved surgery the furthest along in a couple hundred years. That would have been scary. This campus does not have self-satisfaction, and that's a good thing. What we do have is this drive to get better. And that's what I think this plan's about. It reflects the voices you've heard in the committees, from the community, about ideas forward. But those details and implementations are your job. And I want to be there helping along. So thank you, and I think that's the state of the campus.